drag you along somewhere, even if you really didn't want to. I've been there before. Thank God it doesn't last forever, right? But what if you could never get away? Just think, zoo and aquarium animals feel that same trapped feeling every day. No human likes to feel trapped, neither do animals. That's why today I'm going to justify that zoos and aquariums are cruel and inhumane prisons for all animals. But wait, don't animals in captivity live longer? Actually, a majority of captive animals die much sooner than their wild counterparts. Here are some life expectancies of a few popular zoo and aquarium animals. The orca. An, an orca in the wild can live between 30 to 50 years. Some specimens have lived even to their 80s. They can live quite a long time. Sadly, in places like SeaWorld, they can live to only 14 years. Elephants can live between 50 to 70 years. In captivity, reduced to just 15 to 20 years. Big cats are a minor exception to this rule. They can live between 10 to 15 years in the wild and 15 to 20 years in captivity with medical assistance. Although their lifespan has been extended, their, life's, their quality of life is still rather poor. So what exactly makes their lives so bad? There are actually many factors that contribute to this, but I'm going to limit and summarize three. The three factors are harmful living conditions, disruption of natural behaviors, and the enterprise of exotic species. Cramped and unnatural living conditions only worsen the lives of zoo and aquarium creatures. Unfortunately, many zoos and aquariums lack the funds to build and maintain a large enclosure for their inhabitants. Many people don't realize how much space an animal actually needs, which is why it's often overlooked how small these enclosures actually are. Take the Siberian tiger, for example. This cat can grow up to 11 feet long and weigh close to 700 pounds. They're quite large big cats. In the wild, they have a natural roaming range of eight square miles, which is about twice the size of our wildlife refuge. In captivity, their enclosures can be reduced to just 1,800 square feet, which is about the size of this classroom. Talk about downsizing. Another large animal with a large roaming range is a killer whale. These mammals can grow up to 30 feet long and weigh 12,000 pounds. In the wild, an orca pod can travel up to 140 miles in just one day, and they can also dive 400 feet below the surface to hunt. In captivity at places like SeaWorld and other aquatic-based attractions, their tank size is reduced to what we would call the gym. To an orca, a tank is like a bathtub. What's even worse is that these animals are kept in these tanks alone, with little to no social interaction with other orcas, except at showtime. Improper habitat size isn't the only concern facing these animals. Many animals find themselves being kept in harmful enclosures that can result in their own injury or death. This problem is still a concern for zoo animals, but it's a much bigger problem for aquatic-based animals. Large marine mammals like dolphins, beluga whales, and orcas are kept in tanks that are way too shallow for them to escape the harsh rays of the sun, which can result in overheating and sunburns. A recent undercover study of SeaWorld conducted by SeaWorld of Hurt revealed that caretakers were painting their orchids with black zinc sunscreen to cover up scars from sunburns. This same investigation revealed that many of their water animals are being kept in chemical treated water. Like humans, the skin and eyes of these creatures become irritated or inflamed from the harsh exposure to the chemicals. Many sea lions have been blinded or scarred from exposure. Whenever an animal is placed into captivity, many of their natural behaviors are also disrupted, which, has, which has been proven to be detrimental to their overall health. The three major natural behaviors disrupted is feeding, social interactions, and breeding. A report published by the Zoological Society of San Diego revealed that zoos and aquariums are pretty limited to what they can feed their animals. They need to stick to a tight budget, which means they often provide food that doesn't, doesn't have enough nutrients to maintain a balanced diet. These feedings are also done at random times throughout the day, which can throw off an animal's comfortable routine, making their lives even more stressful. Social interactions are also disrupted. Herd animals like zebras are kept in small groups as opposed to living in herds of up to 100 animals. Solitary animals like carnivores, so tigers and other leopards, are also kept in solitary confinement. They don't get the opportunity to create social bonds that are crucial to their health. The most critical social interaction is finding a mate. Sadly, this behavior is disrupted as well. For the specific purpose of making more animals to have in zoos, institutions conduct what's called controlled breeding. 
These practices are often forced, which is far from natural. Animals are shifted from other zoos, and as you know, animals don't like to travel much, so they don't like it either. Also, they're being placed in unfamiliar environments, which once again, big stresses. So how do zoos and aquariums acquire animals in the first place? They can, they can acquire animals through two methods. They either get their animals from captive breeding, like I just mentioned, or they capture from the wild. They also exchange animals for profit and sell the animals they no longer need. This is effective for zoos, but it's really horrible for the lives of the animals. Young animals are a popular attraction everywhere. They increase revenue, so zoos and aquariums will often trade animals to please their audiences. Exotic and rare animals are also traded for the same purpose. Anytime an animal is traded, they are once again placed in unfamiliar environments, which causes more stress. But those babies don't stay babies forever. Once those cute little babies grow up, they are sold to other zoos to be permanent residents, or they go straight into the inhumane breeding program I had previously mentioned. Another method they get animals is by capturing in the wild. Since animals have a shortened lifespan in captivity, the demand for more has been increasing over the years. To satisfy those needs, zoos and aquariums often hire private trapping and hunting companies to go out into the wild and capture wild species, despite it being illegal in many countries. Many animals often die from shock or injury because of this process. So what can happen to an animal living in captivity? An Oxford University study that observed the behaviors of captive animals revealed that they can develop a harmful psychological condition known as zoocosis. Zoocosis is a condition used to describe the stereotypic behaviors of captive animals that are associated with psychological stress. Stereotypic means that it serves no clear function or purpose. The various symptoms of zoocosis are self-mutilation, loss of appetite, constant vomiting, head swaying or bobbing, neck twisting, over-grooming, tongue playing, pacing, and corporate failure of caprophagia, which is when an animal plays with or eats its own feces. So what can you do to help? Well, the number one most effective way you can help is by never patronizing zoos because all their profits go to maintaining enclosures and getting more animals. If more and more people choose to avoid zoos, these places will be forced to shut down and their animals be placed in the better care, thus ending their suffering. I hope after li listening to my presentation today, you realize just exactly how harmful zoos and aquariums can be. Their enclosures are harmful to an animal's health, their behaviors are nat the natural behaviors are disrupted by human interference, and they're put under immense stress whenever they're transferred from zoo to zoo. Remember, by choosing not to patronize zoos, you are doing your part in keeping animals where they belong, in the wild.